Right. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Wisdoms UK Chats. And this morning we are hearing Frank Shapiro's story. So we, we're really looking forward to that one. So with no further ado, Frank, I'm simply going to hand it over to you to take it away. So it's up, all over to you. Great stuff. Well, thanks for asking me to do this. This is this is great. When I was uh, looking at it or thinking about it the last couple of days, I thought, I wonder if they want me to talk for two minutes or uh, 30 minutes. So it will be somewhere uh, just uh, near the two minute mark. But uh, uh, just stop me when, when I've said too much. Basically, I have a really unusual kind of journey through life. Uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, it is. It's, I've had lots of different career changes. Uh, and uh, I suppose if I was summing up my life, I would say it's an I can, I can uh, theme. Because all through my life, I haven't really wanted to be pigeonholed too much. Having said that, I have been pigeonholed a lot. Uh, you know, I, I think I think of my life, I think of anybody's life as stages, although one big flow as well. So I kind of think uh, of my life as being, you know, I've been called lots of things like a son, a brother, uh, a father, um, and some other things as well uh, to do with my, my work. So just to run through what I've done uh, as, a, as a professional life, as a business life. Um, I left school at 16 and I uh, became an optician, would you believe? Uh, I didn't want to be an optician. I didn't uh, dream of uh, going close to people in little dark rooms uh, and smelling the curry that they had the night before. That wasn't my, uh, my intention in life. But at 16, I decided I didn't want to be at school. I wasn't all that good at school. And uh, so I said to my dad uh, that I wanted to leave school. He said, yeah, that's OK, not a problem. Uh, you can leave school. But in those days in Glasgow, um, if you left school without too many qualifications, then you went on the dole. You went on uh, unemployment benefit. Uh, and he said, you're not doing that. So if you get a job, you can leave school. So I went along to my careers officer and I said to him, my dad said, I've got to get a job because I want to leave school. I said, what do you want to do? I said, I have no idea. Uh, he said, uh, OK, let me just check my filing cabinet. He bent down to his filing cabinet and his glasses fell off his nose. And he turned around to me and he said, you know, I've been to the optician so many times about these glasses. And hold on, they're looking for a trainee optician. How do you fancy being a trainee optician? I said, have I got the qualifications? He said, you almost have. He said, there's a few little things we need to do. Uh, I went along for an interview and I trained as an optician. Uh, so that's how I got into optics. Uh, I ended up in optics uh, working for a company uh, who's pretty big in the UK called Dolan and Aitchison. Ed, you'll probably know who they are. Um, and uh, I worked from them from about 1975 to 1985. And then I started my own business, my own optician's business. And that was the beginning of me never working for anybody else again. Uh, so in 1985, I opened up my own optician's practice. Uh, between 1985 and 1995, we opened up another 10 practices. So we had 11 practices altogether within 10 years and a factory that made glasses, made spectacles, made lenses, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, I had a business partner and he, from the age of about 25, discovered that he, he had multiple sclerosis. Uh, so we always had a gentleman's agreement that if one of us wanted out of the business, then we would just sell. We wouldn't go into competition with each other and negotiation of, I want this much for it, you don't want that much for it. We'd never do that. We were good friends. Um, and in 1995, he decided that uh, time was enough. He wanted uh, to retire. We were both only 35 years old. He wanted to retire, didn't want to work anymore. Um, and we had 11 practices, so it was a good business, we had a factory, and so we sold the, the, the company, which allowed him to retire uh, for the rest of his life, still doesn't work, he's not, he's very, he's very poorly now, uh, being in his, in his uh, early 60s, um, but uh, he's never had to work, which I'm really proud of, to be honest with you, because we built something up, and from an early, a very early stage in our company, that was the goal, to build it up to something that would give him a, 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 a happy retirement, a, a less stressful uh, retirement, uh, because stress obviously isn't good for uh, for MS at all. 
So I, I, I'm quite proud of that, that that's what we did. I knew I would be able to go on and do something else. Although at the age of 35, I thought I was retiring as well. And I did a wee bit of that. I traveled the world a little bit, but a couple of days after um, I sold the business, we sold the, the opticians practices, um, the accountant who were, who was acting for the other side uh, was a company called Optical Express that bought us. Again, I don't know who they are, a huge company in the UK uh, nowadays. And uh, their accountant said to phone me up one day, and I had obviously been in negotiations with this guy, their accountant, for a few months. And he phoned me up and said, what are you going to do with life, Frank? I said, I have no idea. I said, I think I'll travel the world. I'll do a bit of this, a bit of that. And he said, no, I, I don't think you want to do that. He said, I think that I've got a business you want to buy into. I said, okay, tell me about it, expecting it to be something like an optician's practice again or whatever. Uh, and it was a pop band. I know nothing about pop. I didn't know anything about pop bands then. I don't know anything about pop bands now. Uh, but I uh, started a company which was a music management company. I had managers underneath me to do all the work. I didn't know anything about it, but I owned the company and worked in it as well. Uh, and we ended up having a, a record label, an independent record label, uh, and a music publishing company for songwriters as well. Uh, believe it or not, the uh, the music, uh, the record company, the little record company that we've got, I think is still in the Guinness Book of Records for having the fastest number one for an independent record label, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, but I didn't know anything about that. I, I didn't know really much about my my idea of music is uh, meatloaf or uh, you know uh, the Rolling Stones that kind of thing. It's not. It's definitely not pop uh, bands. But we ended up having a lot of uh, pretty high profile bands and more importantly, pretty high profile um, songwriters, which is what we really started to concentrate on. So from optician to a uh, music management company. I, I have no idea how that happened in reality. Uh, and the thing is, I like that because it didn't pigeonhole me again. You know, I didn't really enjoy people saying, uh, introducing me as here's Frank Shapiro, the optician, because it wasn't really me. Um, and when I spoke to my family about it, I've got quite a big family, uh, about changing careers, if you like, and not just retiring and doing something else, uh, they all said, "Well, that's just what who you are. You know, you, you don't, you know, you don't like to just go down the predictable road." Like my brother and his wife, one's a retired G, uh, general practitioner doctor, and one's a uh, retired consultant uh, dermatologist, uh, and they said we could never change to do anything else because we're doctors. You know, they were pigeonholed and they felt the strain of that sometimes, and I enjoyed not feeling that strain of just. Being an entrepreneur and saying I can do anything, you know, I, I can change tomorrow to own a coffee shop, I can change tomorrow to own a music management company, I can go back into optics, whatever it might be. So I enjoyed that idea of of not having uh, the constraint of, uh, of of being known as something. So very quickly going through the rest of my my career, and I've written it down here. It was like writing down a CV to be honest with for a new job. Uh, when I, I started to try and think about the things that I've done. Um, so when I was in the music management business, uh, I found in, in pop music, your bands and your songwriters have a very short life to make a lot of money. Uh, you know, you can't be a, well, unless you take that or something like that, or one of these uh, Rolling Stones, you can't really be on, on stage at the age of 45 if you're a pop uh, band or pop artist. Uh, so the whole idea is to make as much money as you can in a very short length of time. I became aware that my uh, clients, the ones who were going on stage, playing in front of, you know, playing in Wembley, 60,000 60, people went across to Japan, all that kind of stuff, and played stadium gigs. Um, and some of them were coming to me and saying, you know, I've got lots of money. I've got lots of, you know, girls or boys running after me. I could have dates all day long if I wanted. I've got a lovely house, got a nice car, uh, got a really nice partner. Um, but is this what life's all about? So I started to become this kind of manager, music manager, which is pretty unknown, of uh, caring about this balance between being famous or being in the celebrity, being in the, the public eye and having a private life. And I, I became quite obsessed with that. And I started to coach them 
on how to balance their life. And I still, to this day, have a company called Dealing With Fame, where I mentor people who are famous. Uh, they could be politicians, they could be in the music industry, they could be news readers, they could be anybody at all. I still have a company where I, uh, I mentor or coach uh, people who are struggling with this balance in life between being famous and being, uh, being a, a, a private person. And I started also niching even further into um, having a, a time where I, I would coach couples who one of them was famous and the other one wasn't because that dealt with some fascinating subjects for me. Uh, one being the, the famous person uh, or the non-famous person would be jealous of the famous person saying, you know, whenever we go out for a meal, uh, people flock around you and they just push me to the back. Uh, or whenever we walk down the street, the same thing happens. But also the other dynamic where the famous person was a bit jealous of the non-famous person because of those very things. You know, you can walk down the street uh, and not be recognised. You can go out for a, you know, a meal or a, uh, whatever and not be recognised. So there was that dynamic. And I started to coach couples in how to deal with that. And I still do. I still get two or three clients that I, that I do that with, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, uh, during that time, I let me just look at my notes again. I'm lost where I was in my life. I'm I'm still only about forty or something like that at this stage. Um, the uh, then then I started to work, um, write a weekly column for uh, a Scottish national newspaper, the Herald. Again, sorry, uh, nobody will have heard of that probably, but Ed will have. Uh, so I had a, a weekly uh, coaching column uh, on uh, in the. the the magazine, the, the weekly Sunday magazine of, of this uh, broadsheet, uh, which was fun, which led to me having a radio show, would you believe, uh, a guest, uh, I was a guest uh, uh, presenter on a London radio show uh, for Capital Radio. Um, I live in Glasgow and the whole topic of this, again, it was all around coaching and things like that. Uh, the topic for this was uh, how to survive living in London. When I went for the audition or the interview, I said to them, do you realise I live in Glasgow? They said, yes, 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 that's OK. We'll just pretend you live in London and, and uh, the likes. So it was all about things like the stresses and strains of living in a big city, uh, which was great. It was fantastic. It was live. It was quite uh, terrifying, but it was uh, it, it was good fun. Um, uh, so I did that. I also was invited to be a guest speaker on cruise ships, uh, which I did uh, for about four or five years. Um, and so I've been on about 60 or 70 cruises, I think. I've lost count. Uh, I don't do it anymore. I haven't done it for the last five or six years or so. Uh, so I've travelled the world and I guess speaker on a cruise ship. I was basically talking on just about any topic that I knew about. Was it business or uh, coaching or celebrity or whatever it was, whatever they wanted me to talk about. It was great. You didn't get paid for it. Uh, I didn't need to be paid for it, which was good. Um, but you got uh, four or five, two or, or three week cruises uh, every year. Um, and it was totally free. You could take a partner with you. And uh, all you had to do is do probably in a two week cruise about three or four 45 minute talk uh, to the audience. So very, very easy way to, to see the world. If anybody's interested in doing that, then uh, let me know if you've got a great topic. I still have a few contacts uh, in, in that business. And one thing that really I, I don't really divulge to, to too many people is that I, uh, I then started to get really interested in um, the human touch and the importance of the human touch. And would you believe I started up a, a little business? It wasn't a separate company. It was just a very small business, uh, which was called the Cuddle Group, C-U-D-D-L-E, Cuddle Group. Uh, and it was all about this importance of touch. And I used to gather people, it sounds a wee bit strange, a wee bit, you know, what on the earth, people, you know, cuddling each other that are, that are strangers. But I used to gather maybe 30 or 40 people in a room, maybe once every couple of months, uh, and go through the importance of touch with them. So it was a wee bit of important, it was a wee bit of uh, coaching, a wee bit of workshop type thing. And then I used to facilitate people lying about, cuddling each other in huddles or in twos or in groups absolutely nothing sexual about it at all. Everybody was fully clothed and, and the likes and that, you know, it was, it, there was no, no sexuality about it at all. In fact, I had to get rid of a few people because they thought it was something a wee bit different. Um, 
but the importance of touch to me has been a theme throughout my whole life. You know, I'm a cuddler. If I met you tomorrow and if COVID wasn't a problem, uh, I'd give you a hug. Hopefully you would, uh, you would allow that um, if, I, if I met you. Uh, my brother's a handshaker, uh, which really frustrates me because it's one of those awkward moments almost every time I meet him, which is quite often uh, where I go to hug him, he'll go to shake my hand, you know, so it's a, it's a weird situation. But anyway, I'm a bit of a hugger. I, I, I love a good hug. I miss a good hug in, in lockdown. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite amazing because I, I, uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to, to that. My goodness, I've just realised the time. Can't I talk? Mind you, I'm talking about the best subject I like talking about, and that's myself. Uh, very, very quickly then, uh, the one thing that I'm looking at now and I'm starting to roll out is a whole series of uh, talks, workshops, courses, whatever, on later life, because I've started businesses in later life. I've started businesses when I'm over the age of 30, 40, 50, whatever you call later life. And I just uh, love the idea of people not being bound by, well, I'm 50 now. How can I possibly start all over again with a new career? Or, you know, I'm, I'm 60 even or 70 or 80. It doesn't really matter. Age doesn't matter to me. As long as I'm healthy, I'll continue in business. I'll never really retire. And I, I, don't, and I say this, but I don't say it in a, in a boastful way that I could have retired at 35 and had a very happy life and like my optician business partner. Um, but I couldn't see myself doing that. Um, so I'm, I'm starting this later life uh, quest of courses and things. That'll be over the next five, 10 years that I'll start to do that. Now, I'm in a family business, as everybody knows. You might know me as the person that sells digital business cards. Well, that's what we do. Me and my two sons are now in business together. We've been in business for about 10 years. Uh, well, I do these other things as well. Um, so uh, I suppose I am employed by my two sons. Um, uh, and we do digital business tools. We make digital business tools. Uh, that's what we do. So really just in line and in, 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 uh, in, in summing up, I feel my life theme is I can do anything at any time in my life. I'm 63 now, 63 yesterday, by the way. Uh, I'm 63 now. I think in 10 years' time, if I'm healthy and fit, I'll still be opening businesses. I'll still be mentoring people who want to open business businesses. I'll still be doing my dealing with fame stuff. And I'll still be working with my sons. Um, and if I had to put a label on my emotional life, I would say the only things I'm really interested in these days is being happy and being positive. That doesn't mean to say I'm never negative, but I'm interested much more in being positive. I'm really sorry I've taken 20 minutes to tell my story, but uh, there have been 63 years to cram in there, so thanks. Mm -hmm. No, no problem at all, Frank. Uh, we, we, we're happy to, to listen to your story. So if there's more you want to tell us, you, you're welcome to. We've had, we've had people who've actually run over two sessions to tell their stories. <laughs> um, it's not a, not a problem at all, but fantastic insights into, into the man, Frank Shapiro. Really interesting uh, career that you've, that you've had there. And uh, so I was just wondering how you deal with, uh, or maybe here's another opportunity for you. How, how, how do you... How do you change the cuddle group into something you can do online? You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's through Zoom. Yeah, I, I haven't. I don't do the cuddle group as much these days. Um, it's got some strange connotations, you know. I mean, I, I keep it reason. I don't want it to interfere with my business life, which is my son's business, you know. And if people start to, to, to and I, I don't have a qualm about it, you know. I'm, I'm quite open about it. But you know, when, when I say to some people, I run cuddle groups, or I did run cuddle groups. They do kind of think sexually, you know, and that that nothing could be further from the truth. I I, uh, I love the idea of non-sexual touch, you know, hugs, um, you know, a massage, a proper massage. Uh, you know, I, I just love those those kind of things, and I think it's so important. I really do. I can't I can't emphasize. I, when I said my my brother shakes hands instead of hugs, um, he's not adverse to hugs. His wife hugs all the time. She's a huggy person like me. Uh, but that's just the way he, he is. And I don't really understand people who don't like a good old hug, you know, but, uh, but everybody's different. So you've got to respect that. And some people have their, their areas that they don't want to, uh, 
they don't want you to come close to. So, um, but yeah, my sons, you know, they're both in their late thirties now. Whenever I see them, they get a hug, whether they like it or not. I don't know if they just put up with it or not, but uh, they get a hug. My uh, my daughter-in-law's exactly the same. They get a hug from me as well. So it's uh, and I, I and I have no problems hugging men, as you know, strange men, strange strange men, strangers. <laughs> uh, I have no problem in hugging strangers, uh, strangers men, as well as strangers women. Um, the other thing you've got to stay away with nowadays is uh, hugging kids, unfortunately. But uh, mm. you know, my old grandkids get plenty of them to, to, to make up for that. So, but the cuddle group is fascinating. If you ever get the chance to go to one locally, uh, because there are other people that do them all around the world, um, then then have a go if you're that kind of person. That's a funny <laughs> thing, actually, Frank, because I'm not particularly a huggy person in in normal life. But in my running life, I am known for my hugs. If I'm working on a on, on a on a checkpoint on a on a tough race, I'll hug someone. Um, when I was working on a race in Spain, every morning I would hug the medical staff because they'd come for their hug. But in normal life, I'm a handshaker. But in my running life, I'm a big hugger, and I'm also known as a tree hugger as well. But I do hug people. But you don't look, uh, and we talked about stereotypes the other day, and you don't look like a hugger, Frank. A man from Glasgow would never be stereotyped as a hugger. Uh, you know, a so, mugger, perhaps, yeah, a mugger, but not a hugger. <laughs> uh, um, but I mean, you know, in the cuddle groups, it, it was amazing because people did come in, there was maybe 30 or 40 in a, in a large room, uh, and people would come in, some of them knowing what they were going to expect, and others totally wary of what they what to expect. But at the end of it, we had a, a, a breakout sessions at the end of it as well, because uh, it took a whole morning to do this. Um, and people, to, to a man and a woman, loved the experience. You know, they wouldn't be there if they didn't want to be hugged anyway, but they loved the experience. And it wasn't just hugging, you know, there was there was petting going on. You know, you would, you would maybe spoon with somebody and uh, either of the same sex or the opposite sex, and you'd maybe run your hands through their hair. So there was some some petting going on. It wasn't just, let's hug, and there we go, we've hugged. You know, it was maybe 10, 15 minutes, two or three, or 10 people might be in a huddle, just all hug, hugging together. That sounds horrible to some people. I can understand that. You know, some people are shrieking at them all and say, oh my goodness, I could think of nothing worse. Um, but the people who are into that kind of thing, uh, hugely beneficial, hugely beneficial. Very interesting. And, and also now I know why it is a schizophrenic. So, I mean, yeah, he's got two completely different lives. So, yeah, <laughs> Trevor and Lee, yeah. Lee, did you want to ask something? Yeah, you oh, muted, Lee. After you, Trevor. Um, I, I'm just fascinated that something in me, even uh, within about uh, a minute or two of you talking, had me put up those lines, see me, feel me, touch me, heal me, listening to you, I get the music. Um, that was just reverberating in my mind as you were talking. And then, and then towards the end of your presentation, I realized that those two lines were a complete summary of your talk, um, which is quite interesting. So I don't know if you had royalties to the Who's music at all. <laughs> Unfortunately not. <laughs> not, okay. Then, then I've got two. There's an unfinished chapter in your little chat um, because you talk of yourself and you talk of your sons. There's someone missing in that equation. Uh, so I don't know if you want to chat about that. And then the other thing that I want to ask is, is um, uh, do you consider yourself to have the Midas touch? And, uh, you know, I don't mean huge, but anything you touch will become successful. Uh, no, I, I definitely don't because I've had failed businesses as well as uh, very successful ones. Um, you know, and very successful ones. I sold the music business as well for a good amount of money. So, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, but there's, there's definitely some that haven't worked. Yeah, you know, I have hundreds of ideas of business entrepreneur ideas, and some of them just are no goers. So, I, I've got the ability to understand when it's a no, it's not going to happen, and stop. Uh, so, so that's the other thing. Uh, as far as yes, there is somebody missing. I forgot to mention my uh, my two wives, uh, two ex-wives, I should say. 
Um, one, I was married with, uh, with her, who are the, the, his mother of my two sons. Uh, we were together for 17, 18, 19 years, something like that. Um, and uh, things happened and we, we, uh, we broke up. Um, the other one, I fell in lust, not love, I fell in lust with a, with a lady uh, who was much, much younger than me. I think looking back on it, she maybe saw pound signs or uh, dollar signs in her, uh, in her head. Uh, we met, were married three months, uh, uh, were not married in three months and then divorced in one year. So uh, that, that wasn't really a marriage. But my two sons, uh, I, I don't see that one anymore. Um, uh, my, my, the mother of my two sons, uh, we, we do see each other. Uh, we see each other at weddings, both my sons are married, we see each other at birthdays and things like that. We're not great friends. Uh, we're not great enemies. Um, you know, our philosophy was the children come first and they always have done. Um, so well, that's, that's that side of it. Not, not a secret, but nothing special to tell. Okay, so on your admission that you don't have the Midas touch, I'm going to withhold the business opportunity I was going to chat to you about. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're curious, we might chat. Yeah. Uh, listen, listen, Trevor, I'm always curious, always curious about anything. Uh, well, okay, let me hold back for Lee. <laughs> Um, yeah, Frank, I think what, what struck me about your story is it, it goes back to our Wisdom's Chats from last week when we were talking about outcomes and flexibility, because it, it sounds like you kind of fell into, or there was a serendipitous, um, ac almost accidental finding of something that then you grew, um, maybe even to your own surprise. Um, and, and, and you just said, oh, there's some things that didn't work, but you've got all these ideas all the time. So I guess my question to you is, you know, how much of life, or certainly from your perspective, is, is just what lands in your lap or what comes to you and you put your hand up and say, yes, yes, I'll do that. And how much of it is actually searching and seeking and I want this and I need this and you, you go after it? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, to be honest with you, the first two, two businesses I, I owned or two major businesses that I owned, the opticians and the music management came to me. You know, I, I didn't want to be an optician, as I said. I had no idea how to be a music manager, but because somebody said they had a, 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 a band that they wanted me to take over, uh, I, I kind of fell into that. Um, I think s since then, um, the, the coaching, the celebrity coaching, the cuddle groups, the businesses with my sons, um, because we've got other businesses, we do coffee shops as well, we've got coffee shops as well. Um, we've, we've sought out, we've, we've thought this is a great idea, let's do. Um, but, but looking at, at my life, you know, I haven't thought of it before, but there is a theme and that is, and I've never thought of myself as, as being somebody like this, but I've always wanted to help others. I, I don't want to help others so much freely. I don't want to just, you know, be available for somebody 24-7. There, there we go. But when I think about the opticians practice, we, we start, my, me and my business partner, who is MS, uh, started that up uh, when we were both 25. And when he was 26, he found out he had MS. And from that day on, my goal was to make sure that he could retire when he wanted to, because he always said he would have to retire at some point early uh, when he wanted to. And our goal of building up the practices was to do that. It was, we could have just sat with one practice and had a very nice life, thank you very much. But we just, you know, and I, I wanted to do that for him. I wanted to make sure that, you know, I was a leading force. He wasn't a well man even when we had the business. So he didn't do a lot of, Stuff. He, did, he came in maybe two or three days a week. Um, so I really kind of ran the business. Um, but my goal was was always on him. It'd be nice. It's nice because we were 50-50 partners and I, I made money out of it as well. Um, and then in the music management, it's exactly the same where when my clients came, you know, we were working them hard. They were, you know, pop bands work very hard, whether you think they do or not. Um, and my 
when they came to me and said they were having a problem with the balance of their life, I suppose my thought was, right, how can I help these people? Instead of most music managers would probably say, I'm stereotyping Ed, but most music managers would probably say, get on with it. You've got a great life. You're making lots of money. You know, just don't, don't moan to me. Um, and I think nowadays, and I don't know if this is a guilt thing, but it's just when talking about this in the last half hour, nowadays my main aim in life is to make sure my two sons are okay. And I don't know if that's because uh, my, their mother and me broke up when they were early teens. Um, although I always saw them, you know, I always kind of like my, my sons, um, I spoke to them every day, saw them three or four times a week. And that's down to my, my ex-wife as well, making sure that they saw me as the father and not just of this person who lives somewhere, somewhere else. Um, but it is, you know, I, I think my the one theme is of my life is that I do want to be doing good for individuals. I, not so much the world, not so much saving the world, although I do care about that. But uh, more, if somebody came to me with an issue, then I would do my best to, to try and solve that. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's interesting. It's interesting looking back. I don't know how many of you have actually done uh, what you've asked me to do and, and told uh, relative strangers uh, about your, your life. One thing I forgot to show you very quickly, one thing I forgot to show you, oh, in fact, uh, share my screen if I if I can. Am I able to share yeah. my screen? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Okay, let me, just, uh, let me just show you something here. About five years ago, I made this up, and it's a really helpful thing for anybody to do in their life. Can you see that? Okay, a, a little Excel sheet. A little yellow kind of thing. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good, good. And what that is, to be honest with you, is if you look down there. So I did this about five years ago. So I was a son my whole life. I haven't put years of dates on there. I've been a brother for that length of time. And I did this just for my own specifications. So the light pink ones were personal and the dark pink ones were career. And I just wanted to lay out when I did certain things in my life. And to be honest with you, this is a business idea that I've got as well for having people make these automatically themselves. Um, and you can see there's different things like being an optician, being a husband. So there was my husband years uh, there. And then there's my other husband years there somewhere. And yeah, I can't quite find out where it is. Uh, but you can see that I've gone through all the things that I can think of there and put a line chart on it. And some of them last to the end of my life. Like I'll always be a son. You know, both my parents are, are dead now, but I'll always be uh, a son. I'll always be a brother, no matter my brother, my son, my uh, brother uh, passes away or I pass away. I'll always be a father, although for some reason I've got the father one into a career thing, but uh, maybe it feels <laughs> more like a career than anything else. Uh, but I made this up and I forgot all about it until I was asked to do it. So I just thought I'd share that wee thing with you. And it's really good if any of you ever want to do that for yourselves. Literally just mark down everything you've been, every label that anybody's put on you, you know. When you go to the school gates, this is Frank, Ian and Barry's dad, you know, so I'm a dad. There's Frank, he's an optician. Put on whatever you've ever been in your life, whether it's real, whether it's physical, whether it's just what, you know, here's Frank, he's a joker. You know, whatever people have labelled you as, put it down and then just put a timeline on it. And it'll be fascinating to see how many of them go right to the end of your life and how many of them are just short interludes in your life. Oh, I'm getting too deep now for myself. I don't understand these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, you said you wanted to, to add some, something in there. Yeah, the, uh, the first thing I wanted to say was Frank sort of illustrates the connectedness of life because when we were chatting one time, we worked out that I probably bought a coffee from one of his sons which is amazing to think about, isn't it? That 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 just you you, you meet someone and, and and you discover that there's a connection somewhere. Um, and the other thing was, Frank, you had three husbands on there, and you told us you had two wives. <laughs> I've got three husbands. You're right. See, I did this five years ago when I wasn't really thinking about it. I've only been married twice, as far as I know. I've only been married twice. Uh, you can, th th that's the auditor in me coming out. You see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you must have that together uh, very quickly, but uh, you get the idea of what it is, and I must update it because I love looking at it and thinking, there's a, 
although I thought that was a huge part of my life, it was a tiny bit of my life. Or there's something that I take for granted, but it takes up the whole span, like being a father or son. Or whatever. Mm. Uh, so. I've, I've got two comments on that quickly, Ed. One for you. It's what comes from too much hugging. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and, and uh, what would be interesting, as I was looking at your chart there, Frank, uh, that represents 100% of your past life. Um, and, and I made the comment, which came from Tom Hopkins, that when we start getting to our age, um, and, you, and you've got a bit of catching up to catch the trail running man and myself here, um, uh, we've got 100% of our life left. And that, that, to me, is almost a blank portion that you should have on that chart with your estimation of how you'd like to spend the remainder of that 100% and what that future chart would look like. So um, that might be quite interesting to consider in that chart. I, yeah. I think it's quite unique. Yeah, that's interesting. That's why I, I didn't put any dates on there because the ones that run right to the end are forever. You know, there's, it's, it's infinity. But you're right, I could put on a, a, a possible future. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, thanks. Lee, you wanted to, to say something? I just want to say thank you, Frank. Well, you know, it, as you say, it's a brave thing to share your story. And, um, thank you. And, and we at Wisdoms are so appreciative of people's personal stories and for people who are willing to step up and just um, give us an insight. And, and it, it makes us appreciate the uniqueness of each person um, and celebrate this incredibly multidimensional uh, humanity that, that, we, that we participate in. And your story is fascinating so thank you for sharing it really really appreciate it and i'm going to ask one cheeky last question can you please drop some names like what are some of the pop bands that you i mean i know you got your your client well, probably can't divulge but tell us some of the pop bands at least that you managed well i'm gonna i'm gonna just say that uh um I, I can't really divulge anybody, but I'm going to say it was round, all round about the Spice Girls era. Uh, I have uh, I've had uh, Spice Girls living with me, not as a partner or anything like that, uh, old enough to be their granddads. Uh, so it was all round about that kind of era. It was all to do with pop. It was all to do with uh, songwriters that wrote for Spice Girls and things like that. So um, there's that, and there's a few boy bands that, that if you were a uh, a teenage girl on the day you would recognize the name of but uh, I won't uh, I won't divulge them and as I say I still work with quite a lot of celebrities and politicians who are in the limelight already uh, at the moment so um so there we go that, there's a teaser for you right can I book you up for five years time when I'm famous <laughs> <laughs> the thing yeah. is we're all famous in our own lives that's one of the things that I try to get across to people is that you know Everybody in my family knows me, which makes me a little bit famous. Uh, you know, my neighbours know me. My, you know, people do know everybody. Fame is a is a strange thing, huge topic, and I, I love talking about it. So, but listen, and, and, thanks very much for asking me to do that. And I'm sorry it's gone on a little bit longer than usual. But not uh, not at all, not at all, Frank. It's an thanks, absolute thanks pleasure. And one one thing we absolutely miss about none of us have said happy birthday for yesterday. So happy happy birthday for yesterday. <laughs> I stopped I stopped counting birthdays about twenty years ago, but uh, uh, I still have the brain of a twenty year old, which is a wee bit unfortunate sometimes. And that's 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 what's important, you know. One one of the things that Trevor and I discuss from time to time is, uh, you know, if you were to start a business now with all the experience that you have gained over the last forty years, what would you do differently? And maybe that's a topic we can. We can chat about because uh, that falls in line with your thoughts for your your new business as well so yeah on on, on that note uh, and, and just to answer your other question that you, you posed there yes we've all we've all shared our stories as well so uh, uh, they're there up, up on youtube and, uh, and and done so uh, right so a topic for next week uh, lee are we going to go with that one why don't you just say it again ivan so i've got it in my head because i think it's a good one um so if you were to start a, biz, a new business today, you know, given the experience that you've had over, over your lifetime, 
what would you do differently? So if you, if you were to start the business that you started in your 20s, um, now, today, uh, what would you do differently? Lovely. Yeah, lovely. Great topic. Let's go with that. Good. All right. Super. Thanks again, Frank. Really appreciate it. And uh, have a great uh, day further, folks. If you join us on the USA one, we've got BJ's, BJ's live story at 3, 3 o'clock our time, 2 o'clock your time in the UK. Um, and uh, other than that, we'll catch you on Wisdom soon. So have a good I, day. Cheers. I can't make BJ's. I've already given my apologies to BJ. So uh, see you tomorrow. Good. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, folks. Thanks right. again. See you later.